Yeah, thank you. 
invited to respond to the questions. So we really want to make this in a discussion and not just a one-on-one. -on -one. So maybe, I don't know, um, we have Julio here, Paul, uh, <laughs> um, and then we have ourselves, but that's the three speakers who will uh, set us off. Did we get some uh, So maybe you want to give well, us why don't Okay, we'll, just, we'll, just okay we'll do it the other way around. Would you like to start? Maybe introduce yourself briefly and uh, start responding. Okay, good morning. Yeah, I come from uh, Taiwan, just as uh, Corona said. Uh, in May, early May, uh, we had the uh, World Heritage uh, Conference in, in Jiaoji, Taiwan. So we were very happy uh, to join uh, this conference with the Corona and the keynote as well. Uh, I come from the uh, uh, National Film University of Science and Technology. I graduated from the Delta uh, in 1985 uh, for the hydraulics engineering. And then I, gave the, I got my PhD in the Flying University of Amsterdam. That's uh, in 1997. So uh, I'm very happy to involve the, uh, both the engineering uh, aspect with the cult uh, cultural uh, heritage with the Professor Lingman because I I, I really uh, don't know how to uh, correct with the uh, uh, heritage uh, from my uh, engineering aspect. So I would like to uh, give uh, some example in my uh, country. Uh, uh, we do have a very early uh, 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 underneath of the river structure for education for how to use it. Uh, that's uh, in 1923, uh, uh, the, the structure. Uh, constructed under of the uh, river bed and the take water during the dry season for irrigation use. And it's quite the smart the thought that uh, in that time, because if you built the uh, surface dam to uh, take water from the surface, uh, but during the some, uh, uh, winter time it's a dry season, you cannot take any water from uh, this river for irrigation water use. So they uh, built uh, underneath the river bed underneath, uh, and then uh, you can take uh, the water all year round for irrigation use. And then in uh, 2008, uh, uh, this uh, structure uh, reaches as a uh, uh, lands, uh, uh, landscape, the uh, 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 cultural landscape uh, to preserve it. So uh, the, the uh, cultural landscape does mean you can uh, widen your uh, why uh, they separate your space with the uh, some of the uh, uh, farmer uh, farmer, uh, and then you can expand to the uh, such as uh, the green uh, the farmer. You uh, can involve uh, uh, to preserve the disastrous. So that's uh, I've done before. As I mentioned. I'm Paul Hudson. I'm a physical geographer just up the road at Light University. Um, before, and my main interests are in um, river dynamics and um, uh, water sciences, uh, especially in lowland rivers. Before coming to the Netherlands, I was at the University of Texas at Austin for 12 years for I spent most of my career. Um, I've worked in uh, Mexico um, quite a bit. Um, and, and there, with regards to thinking about rivers, you have to think about uh, indigenous American culture and how that intersects with the river dynamics. Uh, very interesting. Um, I've worked in uh, Texas. Uh, very, very interesting there. There, when we think about, you know, in the New World, often when we think about heritage, 
uh, we think about it under a different time scale than when we think about it uh, over here. Uh, and as, as an American, that's taken me a while to get my head around that, actually. Um, and I also work in uh, the Lower Mississippi Valley in uh, Louisiana. That's where I do most of my work now. And, and now, increasingly, I'm working in the Netherlands trying to plant my flag here. Uh, working in the Ruhr River in, um, in Limburg, where they're uh, introducing this rewilding, uh, rewilding uh, sort of uh, uh, regime, in, in environmental management regime, to the, uh, uh, to the system, which I think also is very important with respect to heritage there. Um, I have just a few key points to make. Uh, one of them, I think that it's, um, it's helpful when we talk about water heritage that, that we do as much as possible, zoom in to the topic of what do we actually mean by uh, water. And when I think about it, I think about it as, you know, there's a number of discrete types of water bodies that have a certain dynamic to them. And we need to think about those dynamic processes if we're gonna think about heritage and the management of that heritage that are linked and associated to that. Uh, in some cases, the, the, the uh, her heritage, we're talking about cultural heritage then, that can influence the physical processes. In other cases, of course, the physical processes of the system are going to be, uh, have impacts to the cultural heritage there. And, and specifically, we could be talking about rates of river erosion, which can actually remove uh, archaeological materials, or it could be that we are burying these older cultural materials by uh, sedimentation. Uh, so then it's very helpful to have an idea of what are these rates of sedimentation, and, and then we can start to actually uh, prospect and think about where they might be located. Uh, and that kind of goes into the field of geoarchaeology a little bit. Uh, another point is that I, I think what I have seen, my, my main um, link to this concept is not as square as yours quite obviously there, but I do it from an applied perspective, and it's often the case that heritage is kind of a, maybe a driver, sometimes actually a funder of funds my uh, riverine research, but it may not be the main goal of that research. Uh, and it also can be a constraint to what I can do as a scientist, actually, especially a field scientist there. Um, and so often I see that there's kind of a tension between what we think of as, um, in, from the standpoint of water heritage, from the standpoint of the cultural heritage, and also from the natural heritage, if you will. And I think we see that most prominently with respect to dams. Dams, which we have no idea how many dams exist globally, but there's probably several hundred thousand, and these exist in all different forms and shapes. Uh, many, of course, most of them have out, they're all built for one reason, there's an economic driver behind it. Many of them have outlived their purpose um, and may now be considered, you know, cultural heritage. Um, nevertheless, these dams are impacting the natural water heritage and really do detrimental things to the natural system there. So these two things can be very difficult to reconcile in kind of the integrated management perspective. Uh, and in some cases, um, I have seen actually the concept of, of water heritage, cultural heritage really being hijacked or exploited. So we, you know there are different interests that can latch onto this. So we need to be a little bit careful there. Uh, and a key example there would be in, in the U.S. Uh, a dam I was working on. <coughs> the dam's only 120 years old, which is nothing over here, of course, but in the U.S. that's a long time. And uh, of course it made a little mill dam, mill pond behind it, and there are business interests that want to use that to build a whole theme park and restaurants and so forth. And so uh, from the natural perspective, it's completely detrimental and we need to get rid of it because there are endemic species associated with a unique hydro system there. So there's real natural heritage associated with this, this uh, system there. Uh, the cultural heritage, if you want to call it that, is a, a pile of rubbish, I would say, almost. That's about 120 years old, no longer serving its purpose. But the business interests have latched onto that and, uh, are, in my opinion, are kind of exploiting that. So I think that's one example, and I have a feeling that that's also there, there's, that's much more pervasive than, than maybe we've uh, realized. Um, I, I think I'll just leave it from there uh, for right now. But, uh, yeah. uh, really interesting. Um, well, I maybe I'll just say three things. Uh, one is to the first question, it's a question, but one thing that's worth noting for this group and for the heritage conversation is just how homogeneous. 
uh, thinking about what uh, actually is in, uh, you know, um, around the world. It's kind of surprising. Essentially, you know, the experience of the Mississippi and of the West United States has really shaped the way in which most hydraulic engineering is done around the world. And most of the, you know, we've, we don't, it's true, we don't know how many dams there are, probably actually millions if you count all the barrages, but they do capture, according to the world's market, about 17% of all rainfall on the planet. I mean, we've replumbed the entire hydrology of the planet, and we've done that in the 20th century. In fact, essentially in the first half of the 20th century. In fact, in the first half of the 20th century, when the primary base of capacity for electrification was hydropower. Um, and I, I think you have to start with that to understand what other options we have. That can, you know, we have to recognize that sometimes people assume that the water security we enjoy today is kind of the standard. It's very unusual in the history of humanity that we have a world in which we never almost touch water. And that's largely the result of the first half of the 20th century. So that's the first thing. Uh, and there are all these complicated questions about heritage about that. The second thing I would say on the methodology, I'll bring a very sort of partial and some more um, practitioner and sort of advocacy point of view here, but there are real decisions um, to be made ahead of us. I'll give you just one example. If we are going to meet the Paris Agreement targets, which, you know, amongst us friends, we're unlikely to, but if we are, uh, they have to, they have to involve a whole bunch of land use change. Really dramatic land use change in agriculture, in you know, afforestation, reforestation. That's going to change the hydrology of a number of places around the world at a measurable scale. You'll be able to see from the moon, right, if we're going to meet those targets. Um, and so people are making these claims about what should happen on the landscape with no real understanding of the implications that that might have for water security, river uh, uh, morphology, and like. And so that's the second thing I'd say is there are a lot of choices ahead of us that are really material water security, and right now nobody's really realizing that these things come together. And the third and last point uh, I would make is that some of the things that you're examining, practices that may have, you know, may have been considered obsolete until recently, or you know, people solving problems different ways, have value, have value even today in the context of very mundane economic conversation. It is important that policymakers consider options in the framework that they use, which is a sort of cost benefit analysis, so all sorts of limitations. But I think that a lot of things you're talking about are susceptible to that kind of examination in that context and should be. And right now, they're not because they're disciplinarily isolated. So you end up, sort of, my point again, you know, Bologna's water system, the, the Rhine, it's a Rhine, it's not the Rhine, but it's a small Rhine, it was mostly developed in the 12th and 13th century. Um, all of the infrastructure at the is still there. We still have navigation canals from that time. They're managed by a reclamation bureau, but how those things function is managed by the heritage uh, ministry. It has nothing to do with the function of the system. So this integration being part of the solution set. Uh, and so I think a group like this could contemplate how to help integrate those things. Okay. Um, I'm wondering, does everybody, you were so quick and fast, everybody <laughs> on these points, uh, that, that I'm wondering whether we should first disentangle them. But it, we also have a lot of knowledge in the room. So it might be just as well that we have a quick round of who is who. Um, and then I would like you to disentangle the land use water question first. Okay. Does that, is it a quick, uh, yes? Yeah. Can I move it to you? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no problem with introduction. <laughs> just go for it. Okay. Or well, introduce yourself when you talk. That's what I want to do. My name is Mitch Kajman. I'm president from the University of Dallas, in Slovenia. Uh, when you, when you spoke, and when I see those questions, you say it's space, society, culture. Uh, when the society or the form of the society changes, uh, in, in my experience, also the economy and the water changes. Uh, for example, in the, after the Second World War, the society in the communist countries changed, and the small family production, which was connected with water, because of a lot of soul meals and other kind of meals, uh, they stopped producing. And what happened next was that all the water which was in this very small streams parallel to the main river went into the main river, and as a consequence today we have disasters. We have big floods because of that. And uh, it's of course it's a big um, it's a it's called cultural landscape. Uh, when you go into the areas where there were uh, these uh, small uh, streams, uh, you, you can see of course still the the bed of the stream, but no water there. Uh, so 
all those uh, notions are very, very connected. I mean, they are independent from one, from one another. Uh, the other thing I was um, thinking, uh, listening to all three of you, is that we have sometimes strategic products that come out of the water, like salt. Salt is uh, the salt pans or the salt are the reasons, the strategic reasons why wars and fights happen, why ports grow. Yeah? So there is again a connection with the water, the production of the water, and then what happens in a strategic way or in a military way, and what happens to the society. And then what you said about the interdisciplinarity of the sectors, that's also why my um, experience, for example, is we don't work together. Because uh, at one side, some sectors think, well, you architects and or planners don't know anything about it. So it's, it's not necessary to be work together. Yes, do you want to, any, anybody else who wants to react right away? Otherwise, yes, go. Yes, commenting on the, uh, uh, wants to comment on the remark made on the agricultural change that needs to happen. Uh, definitely so. I mean, we have a really recent PhD in the Netherlands and you know, the agriculture would be looking more like the agriculture of the 1950s uh, than it is you know, what's happening now. Uh, and I would like to, to extend that to uh, projects, World Bank projects now uh, funded by the World Bank in uh, parts of Africa where you know, there's still big irrigation projects. Um, and there uh, was uh, disregard for the material. Uh, uh, a technical cultural heritage, uh, which leads to an over, um, over innovation, and uh, these some of these projects are likely to fail. And, and that's my, my prediction because of that, because heritage is not taken on board, let alone you know, lack of governmental you know, infrastructure support, etc., to the different angles to this. So I think uh, if, it, if we look at what needs to be added, I think there should be more attention to the intangible cultural heritage uh, in terms of agricultural practices, uh, fishery, and how that also relates to, to biodiversity um, in, in terms of the bigger, bigger picture. You didn't tell us your name, right? Sorry, my name is Benno Welling. I'm a uh, lecturer at the Applied and Museum of Heritage Masters in the Rank Academy. Okay. okay. I think what we're going to do, Tina, is set up a disc, because I would like to sort of get you all in a kind of this. Um, and you may if I could just take the uh, screen. There, we have one um, article in, in, in the book, and I'm going to, because this whole question of narratives is fascinating. So there's a Japanese case of land reclamation. There's a land reclamation museum in the area. So it was a lagoon with brackish water, but the whole history that is now being told is about the achievement of reclaiming land from the sea and getting all kinds of people settled there, building new uh, agriculture business and so on. But the history of the fishermen who lost their businesses, who lost their way of life, is not told there. And I think that is very, that speaks to this question, what is the, uh, the, the, the perfect agricultural system for what? Is it flat for the other? Is it draw for someone else? And that kind of level of thinking is what we usually lack, and as much as we Every time we concentrate on just one specific um, place, the farm that demonstrates that reclamation in the museum, we lose out on many other stories. You don't have to lose them out as long as you tell us. Exactly, but that's what's really happening. Yeah. 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 And if I may add, for example, there has been in history also that people who have the knowledge how to deal with water, either that was inland water or the sea water, they were moved to other places, and then new people were brought in who didn't have no idea how to deal with it. And that also was a big problem. Other reactions right away, otherwise, I go back to the question of land use. Can you explain to us more? Because I think this is a really big theme and very important, but I'm not sure that it's, everybody is aware of it. So, how? Uh, does the land use play a role? Well, um, uh, people that are probably more confident need to elaborate, but I'll give it a try and ask you to correct me. Um, well, the stuff of basics, just in case. 
Obviously, agriculture represents by far the largest use uh, of water. Um, if you look at consumptive uses of water, meaning water then ultimately evaporates, not just uh, withdrawals, then you're talking about 90 plus percent of the water that we're using is, is, is uh, actually the agriculture goes through. Uh, glucose and, into, uh, and about transferring into the atmosphere. So it's, a, it's this massive pump, right, that's kind of operating around all these rivers. 40% um, of the food production is irrigated in the West, it's kind of rain fed, but in, in either cases you have kind of great system integration. So um, choices that you make on the landscape change this natural, uh, this biological pump uh, that, uh, you know, draws water from uh, the watershed and changes the hydrological balance of the, of the, of the river. This is where I should elaborate much more. The, the important point is this. If you ask the, maybe unfair, if you ask the Army Corps of Engineers who manages a lot of the infrastructure on the Mississippi, say, um, in their cost curves, the sort of sequence of cost effective solutions to problems, do they uh, include uh, land use as one of the tools, or if you went to the utility, let's say Thames Water, it's a private company, it uh, invests you know a couple of billion dollars a year in the watershed. You look at their cost curve and say, well, you know, so I add a reservoir, then they add a dam, and then they add a thing, and then they add a thing. In that cost curve, do they put in farmers use less, you know, say two percent less water? Because change, a small change in land use, has profound impacts on the hydrological balance because it's such a big part of the water cycle. And so the answer is no. In most of these cases, there are these cones of shadow where because of you know, different responsibilities and sort of institutional silos, you end up not having this integrated picture. Now, you could get very obsessed about the complexity of the world. And it's complicated in all sorts of interesting and unfathomable ways. But some of these problems can be brought together because there are institutions that can worry about both. You know, whether it's states or planning commissions or other. And so that's, I think, the space where there's an opportunity to do this. And the last thing I'll say, and then I'll show you, is I just note that we are at a particular moment for land use because I can guarantee you in the next five, ten years, we'll come to the realization that decarbonization is neither happening fast enough nor is it going to be enough to meet these carbon sequestration targets, uh, carbon mitigation targets. Uh, and so we will have to, some of the how, intervene in the landscape. How that will happen, that's a kind of, kind of open question. I mean, Ethiopia, they just planted hundreds of millions of trees, which is kind of crazy. Them. There you go. So, does that help? Yes. I think that's an excellent point. If I could follow up on that a little bit, I think it's important to just identify that what we've just said there, there's two major impacts that go in very different directions, very different, and that is land use and with respect to water. I uh, agree with you, but the other thing to consider here is that soil erosion. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna, we know for food production projections, we have to, most of the, it's not gonna be irrigated, most of it, it's not gonna be like what we have in West Landing warehouses over here. It's gonna be in marginal climatic areas which are more vulnerable to soil erosion. Uh, so we can expect that to increase uh, greatly. Uh, that also has an effect on the carbon cycle because uh, the upper 20 or 30 centimeters of the soil, the top soil, is where most of that carbon is stored. So there's more carbon stored in the soil 30 centimeters than there is 30 meters above and all the trees above it, right? So we really have to pay attention to soil management there. Um, historically, prehistorically, a lot of that eroded soil, be it in the New World, be it here from the, the Romans and the Belgian and so forth, a lot of that eroded soil is just laying down there at the foot of those hill slopes or in those smaller channels there. And you can go to Limburg, for example, and you see these high uh, channel banks, which should not look like that at all. Uh, they've just buried the riparian landscape, so the natural wetlands that would have been there have been basically buried. And you can see them underneath the soil and dark layers and roots and stuff like that still sticking out. Um, in some ways, there's, your, there's our cultural heritage, right? It's eroded soil that's just uh, laying there. Uh, the other thing here about the dams is that, you know, upper slope, more erosion, but these dams are now preventing soil from sediment from making it to the coastline. So our deltas and our coastal areas, and this is, a, you know, one of the reasons why the uh, 
um, IPCC won the Nobel Peace Award was drill, really drawing attention to erosion and vulnerability of these large coastal deltas because they're being starved of sediment. It's just not making it to the coastline anymore. Um, it's being trapped behind these massive uh, uh, hydraulic infrastructure, these dams, basically. Uh, so I don't know what we want to do with that. But, uh, there's, there are some procedures now for trying to flush sediment around the dams and so forth and uh, to introduce pulses, uh, but that's a long way to go. Uh, I would like to give a very successful example in my country. Uh, in, in 1970, in, uh, yeah. <clears throat> uh, all pump in front of the water and the uh, result of the dam subsiding at the coast area. So every year we meet the typhoon and the we do have the earthquake and we do have the, uh, the, uh, the debris, yeah? And uh, short of the uh, water during the summertime, uh, we do have the, uh, the, the, the uh, precipitating uh, around the uh, 1,500 millimeters per year. So how to solve the problem between the uh, summer, uh, summertime uh, uh, on the flood? And so uh, uh, for the land subsidence area, because the landscape, uh, the, the people live there for the uh, over 100 years, so you cannot move there for the new land use uh, over there. So how to uh, adapt the uh, can change uh, for this uh, real case. So we had uh, back the 30 years before to, do, um, uh, to research um, mitigation and uh, adaptation. That we think one policy in Taiwan nowadays that uh, uh, benefits water reuse from storm water. So in the meantime, uh, you can uh, do, uh, uh, mitigate the flood uh, and upstream and uh, make better use of our largest reservoir, underground reservoir, we call the uh, ground water reservoir. Mm -hmm. So we can store the storm water in the, into the uh, groundwater reservoir and reduce the uh, flood and the downstream. So it can solve the, 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 the two problems, the uh, subsidence at the coast area, and then the, you can get much more the water resource from the uh, groundwater reservoir. So <clears throat> that's been uh, you cannot uh, solve the uh, land use the, for the uh, over 100 y years people live there. So you just uh, the, another sort to solve this problem and uh, keep the uh, land use as well as uh, you use the um, artificial recharge of groundwater facility that can keep the uh, ecological sinking uh, and finally uh, make the dam uh, you just said uh, dam, and uh, because we, we in my country we do have the uh, debris and the, a lot of the sedimentation and accumulate at the reservoir or the uh, river uh, intake before the intake uh, again. And in the meantime, uh, sometimes they uh, get a lot of the uh, very high the built, uh, the built water cannot purify by the plants. So uh, <coughs> you do uh, uh, short of the water during the summertime and the dry time. So the best way uh, how to make the use of bed, uh, better use of our largest reservoir in Taiwan, uh, mitigation and adaptation benefits uh, water reuse from storm water. Now today we make this project uh, completely uh, uh, two years ago. So uh, new new uh, land use and uh, upstream for the fishing man. Uh, fishing uh, the population rate is still uh, uh, there, and then we have to uh, resolve some uh, inundation area and the coast area. So that's uh, my experience in Taiwan. Okay. I think your last question is important because you know, what is an endlessly fascinating and rather complicated subject. And there's a risk of you end up having a long conversation about how you solve it, which I'm not sure is the, the most uh, productive. But, but if your question is what does world heritage do, I think there's two things that are, for me, really important. And they're both about expanding the imagination of the conversation that we're having about water, mm -hmm. right? So one is looking back. So for example, this point about said it's really important. If you read Plato's Critia, for example, the dialogues, there's a whole section around how the hillsides were coming down 
right? Because in the fourth century, we see, you know, Athens was the United States of the Mediterranean. It essentially exhausted Attica's landscapes, 30,000 hectares, deforested, goats all over the place. There's nothing keeping the love soil in place, and they're all washing down. They end up moving and settling in Sicily and all the other places, right? And so one part of what a heritage's role, I think, is to reveal that these problems are not, you know, they're always contextual, they're always different. You can't learn from the past direct, but you can learn that this is a very human problem and that it's been confronted over and over and over again. And by the way, it ultimately has a lot to do with politics, with the big key. Who gets to live where and what does he or she do with the land? It's kind of central to the question, right? The second thing you can do through the water heritage lens is shine a light on things that people are not looking at. And so again, to this carbon point, you've made a very good point around. So wetlands are likely going to be a critical part of the answer to carbon sequestration, hugely productive ecosystems. We need to care about them. Ramsar is not successful, frankly. I mean, nobody that's outside of Ramsar knows that Ramsar exists, so we have a problem, and we depend on them. And so figuring out how you tell a story uh, of wetlands that connects to the identity of people, I mean, to be a little kind of Gramscian here, it's kind of important, right? You want to create a picture that says these are part of our identity, they matter. Therefore, put them in the decision-making process. Yes. <coughs> um, introduce yourself. <coughs> Sorry, yes. Hello, I'm Adrian Yildirim from Turkey. I'm the Econos Vocal Point for the USD. I'll start over again, yeah, Turkey. I'm Adrian from Turkey. I'm the Econos Focal Point for the SDGs right now. And um, I'd like to add to um, that point about the political aspect. And maybe move it a little bit from the engineering and positive sciences um, approach we've been having um, in the last minutes to the more social sciences approach in terms of the philosophical, the artistic, and the geopolitical aspects of water. I don't know if somebody covered it in the beginning but I'm answering the questions. Um, first of all, maybe Philosoph um, philosophically looking at this, water is an element in, let's say, Eastern philosophy, you know, one of the large elements. And uh, sometimes the scarcity and sometimes the flooding, the overabundance, you know, the imbalance um, of, of water is our human problem, it seems. And this is a theme that's been covered over arts and literature over centuries. Maybe there's some um, resource to tap into there, the symbolism, the philosophy about water. Uh, secondly, um, the, um, the politics of it. I come from Turkey, um, which is um, a very geopolitically water-wise, you know, complicated country, and I can give three examples of the politics of water. Not just, one is not just from Turkey. Um, it's Mare Nostrum. Um, I mean, the, the, that's, you know what that means. It's the Mediterranean, it, our sea. And just like um, the Mediterranean, also you have that in the Arabian or Persian Gulf, and it may be found in the Baltic and all other sea communities. Um, it ties ports and countries and cities and communities together better than land um, does. Um, there are more similarities between, you know, waterfront cities sometimes than um, cities in the same country, you know, from in different geographies of the country. Um, so I think in terms of the human cultural associations of water, that might be um, something that um, gives us more um, traction in terms of our narratives. And it's also a cause of a lot of conflict. Um, I've been following the uh, UN meetings, the high-level political forums for ECOMOS for the last uh, couple of years. And Turkey, for example, had one, um, um, what's the word, like a reservation in the political declaration at the end of the SDGs meeting, the paragraph about water. Um, because of the problems in the Middle East with the Tigris and the Euphrates and you know the water sharing with Iraq and downstream. Um, so they're very sensitive about that. But it's also, again, a connector with Greece, because Greece is now leading the cultural heritage and climate um, topic um, in the UN circle. And uh, Turkey, we share the same sea with them. You know, this archaeological coastal sites in Greece, um, we, we are on the same boat with them, um, excuse the pun, um, about our coastal um, sites. So you know, um, it can actually help us bring together um, in terms of our psychology. So um, just a few uh, ideas. And maybe we can connect that to the engineering, the engineering aspects, like the, how the downstream upstream relations, um, to the geopolitics of watersheds, you know, we can apply it to land use questions as well. I would say. Yeah, I'm Rachel Gada. Um, Julio's comment on the third question, I just want to add that uh, yesterday I mentioned that as 
a jury member of the World Monuments Watch, uh, we strategically targeted you know, certain projects. Among them is the traditional water systems of the Deccan, which are listed. It's a great case study, you know, sort of uh, for the third, third question. If you go to World Monuments Fund webpage, you'll find the video clip, you'll find the case study and all of that. The first question, that bend in the river, the, the, my presentation, that bend in the river is really critical. Why Buddhism took birth in northern India, but why Mahayana Buddhism took birth in this place? It became the world's largest faith uh, until the Cultural Revolution in China. You know, from this, this why there and why not somewhere else? So how what has shaped space, society, and culture around the globe? This is a very important data because it's the watershed between the dryland agriculture and the wetland agriculture, and the introduction of iron technology at a particular point of time to die and plow shape. Uh, but it's uh, this village, you know, is uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama's most sacred spot because it's the birthplace of Mahayana Buddhism. Uh, I think it is a really important question, so I really appreciate that. I think we will need more illustrative case studies. I think one of the broader, and I love this concept of water heritage, and like one of the, the another way in which it can be utilized is it, it empowers indigenous communities to kind of reclaim some of their land that have been taken from them. Uh, a good example is in, I, I think it's still the case of the largest dam removal project in the world in uh, northwestern U.S. in the Elwha River Basin, because Native Americans. Um, Required and dependent upon salmon uh, for food and for all kinds of purposes. And the dam, of course, killed the salmon. And so they removed the dam largely to restore the salmon to benefit the indigenous people there. Uh, and so that's a great example of kind of reconnecting the landscape with the water there. On the other end of the world, uh, in New Zealand, just a couple of years ago, uh, Maori people were able to, after over 100 years, to get. Um, Wendawi, uh, the name of the river basin escaped from them already. They were able to get the river basin to have the same legal rights as a person. Uh, so that's incredible, actually. Uh, it, it does leave open all kinds of questions. Can you kill a river and, and so forth? But, but literally, it has the same legal rights as a person. Just to mention, I'm present in on track, just on questions of cosmology and spirituality. And yeah, this was really eye opening because we had different examples and papers from all over the world. And these are often very local, regional stories that you've never heard before. And uh, it's really how strong the, the bonds between people and culture and water actually is. And yeah, so I think this is a very, very important um, part to, to, to look at. And, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, water rights system, complicated in all sorts of ways. 
And, uh, and so there's a political question, there's also a legal framework question, it's really fascinating. Um, uh, I could go on and on about this. But, it, but it, in some ways, it's part of that cultural heritage question. I mean, again, the fact that this question is cultural heritage. As a, a friend of mine used to say, paraphrasing me, also, that in water we have god like technologies, medieval institutions, and hyperlithic emotions. And I think there's something. Can you say that again? I think that. We have god like technologies, medieval institutions, and hyperlithic emotions. <laughs> and I think there's some truth to that. And so the role of heritage, I think, is kind of breaking out um, uh, some of those layers. You know, I know so often when I'm having a conversation about the technology that it's medieval institutions. They're really medieval. In fact, a lot of the water law was reinterpreted in Roman, where I come from, um, and the Palestinian motion well, I think that was somebody else, but. You know what I mean? So how, how do we deal with it? I, I don't have. I don't even have an answer. I can tell you how we're dealing with it in the Colorado, which is you know there's a water rights system, and we actually you know I'll give you an example. So the Colorado stops at the, at the Morales Dam, right? The the last, the first dam in Mexico. You can stop your the Colorado River, the mighty Colorado, with your foot in Mexico. There's nothing there. And uh, about a year ago, we bought fifty million dollars worth of water and created this pulse that went through all of the dams of the Colorado and kind of inundated the, water, the, the uh, delta again. For about six weeks, it was a pulse for you. And you can imagine, you know, all these bits of pieces of infrastructure that you have to operate to get the thing to go through with the same shape, right? So it's kind of interesting problem. There goes on this stuff about other people. There's a bilateral, uh, the Minute 19 is this bilateral agreement in Mexico and the United States on how this river gets connected to the Transboundary River. Anyway, we really flood the thing. We wanted to do it because we wanted to show that the second largest delta in North America would revive, um, which it did. The most extraordinary thing is that the biggest impact was there were villages there and communities that had resided in this place along the river that wasn't there anymore. And you suddenly had these kids who see water flowing through the bay for the first time. And so they're playing in this river. And, Right. And so, um, well, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm rambling. I even forgot the question. The point is, <laughs> it's kind of complicated, right? I mean, getting to these issues is really specific to the conditions of individual rivers and industry. Uh, it's good. Uh, Fairly and then, like, I was wondering, you lost the land students um, in the Netherlands. They have a nice problem, or they have uh, created. And now we have a problem with the farmers. And we can say, of course, it's scarcity, but you have water, you have less water, then we don't do so much. We have to think of less agriculture. But then the farmers say, this is our way we earn our daily bread. So what are we going to do then? Then this other stuff, so then we have what happened in the past with other transformation in the landscape shaping now. So maybe we can learn from that past and use it because we can say, of course, we have to save the system. We have big climate problems. But Focusing, telling the story on a personal perspective is something we see now, which has been happening all over many centuries. And we have to do something about that. But um, have you been studying that or seeing that? Well, we, uh, so as an organization, we don't operate in the Netherlands, but we have, you know, there's a lot of learnings from 20th century Dutch experience, you know, the movement around the, of the river, which in part was on um, core work in part was here in the Netherlands. Um, but I, I point out that those histories and those stories are so important to reframe the narrative. And it's never, there's never a right answer, right? It's always kind of complicated. I'm reminded that, you know, I mean, to kind of bring it to the first point, Europe exists on a Spanish model, which is basically the Scheldt agreement, right? So the heritage of water uh, from the Netherlands is also the fact that the Scheldt has forced a conversation about transboundary sharing that has created this architecture for uh, sovereign negotiations. So those stories from the farmer to the national, I think are super important for people to realize that the conversation about water is not a technology conversation. It's a political conversation, therefore there's no right answer, but it has to be a negotiated answer. One, two. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I would like to give a comment and a suggestion based on uh, our research in China. I'm from the uh, Institute of Remote Things and uh, Digital Arts, Chinese Academic Science. Yeah. So, uh, first, I'll give a comment. Uh, what heritage is really, uh, it's very, very important. 
one number that most important uh, topic because uh, water heritage is uh, sometimes is uh, usually is usually uh, living heritage, especially in China. Uh, just uh, you know, China as a uh, uh, agricultural uh, country, so uh, there are many, many water uh, heritage. So, uh, so we 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 talking this uh, uh, water heritage. So, uh, first, uh, I said it's very important. Second, I give a uh, suggestion. So, uh, uh, these uh, three to uh, three topic is very important. It's especially uh, uh, the other uh, the the second. Uh, upon the methodology research. So we, 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 we uh, really we, 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 we need to, how to research uh, upon the what heritage. I suggest is uh, we should give a micro scope, a large scope. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, what heritage, not only uh, just the, the heritage itself, uh, such as project, such as uh, channel, dam, those judges, uh, for example, in China. Uh, west of China, uh, such as in Xinjiang province, uh, uh, there are many oases. In ancient time, many oases. So there are uh, exact many irrigation system. So this water not uh, uh, like uh, uh, European from rainfall, but uh, from uh, uh, glacial or slow melt uh, water. So that is the water uh, irrigation system, and uh, that is the uh, 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 water system is from a mountain channel and the irrigation system, and then is to oasis. That is the farmland. So if uh, we uh, water heritage just focus on uh, 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 now is a dam or channel. We couldn't understand what is uh, what heritage. So the second uh, topic is a very important: uh, geographical space. So uh, 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 now, uh, because uh, now we we say we just say uh, uh, agriculture. Uh, this what heritage is the living heritage. For example, in Myanmar. Mima in, in, in 400 years ago is a very prosperous uh, in ancient uh, in, because in that time there, the, there was a very uh, excellent irrigation system. But now this uh, ancient uh, irrigation, uh, irrigation uh, system project uh, is disappeared. So that influence uh, at, at the present uh, today's uh, MIMA's uh, economic development. So, so last year I invested in MIMA. So how to restore this ancient irrigation system and then serve to today's the, the, the economic development and another uh, for the tourist. Uh, 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 I said this is uh, Pogan, Pogan and uh, in MIMA. Uh, this year uh, is a successful application about uh, as a water cultural heritage. So now post uh, uh, heritage, uh, one side how to protect this uh, water heritage, and another how to uh, uh, restore ancient uh, this irrigation system. So it's uh, important. Now uh, 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 climate change uh, influence our uh, especially Asia, Central Asia. Uh, 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 water system, for example, Tibet Plateau, that is glacial, and another. Uh, so the, around the plateau, there are many countries. So we we, we together use this water. So we say that is a high uh, Asia mountain. So now we are uh, in the curve, uh, 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 carrying out uh, the project the research research project. So the, uh, when climate change, how to influence this uh, uh, glacial and uh, slow melting, and then uh, uh, um, another country, how to use this uh, uh, fresh water? So that is important. So I mean, we research water heritage. We must give a large scope. That's my opinion. Thank you very much.
uh, residential area time, which I think is also is a part of the city. So these people also used to have access to the water, and now they don't have it. So that's also, I think, something that we should discuss. So it's not only the, the, the water, which we talk a lot about the, the use of water, but it's also about the feeling, connection to the water, that you are connected to this city with a river, and not having any side. About the idea of the commons, I mean, national legislations define their use as a public and private. Uh, some states, or my experience is that it's everything but water, and all the water plants or the river plants are public. So that would be private. What does this mean in the context of sedimentation, which you talked about? Uh, uh, it's much worse, because the land is flushing, the sedimentation is worse. No one can So when people are but this I speak for out of my experience. Yeah. <laughs> uh, when people are private and when people are used for the economy and for the function of the mills, yeah, the owners need to care of this situation. When he became a public, you know, it was the state ownership. Who cares?
you know, the NLP committee and an Australian government funds them uh, to attend the meetings. And somehow you have Vienna World Heritage City because the rehabilitation of the International Hotel has gone 32 feet above the skyline. is put on the World Heritage in danger. But the Great Barrier Reef, which is dying, is still not on World Heritage in danger. So water politics, even professional bodies, are they sell out? You know, these are really important issues when we talk about land use. Venice isn't either. Huh? Venice doesn't put, sorry. Venice. Venice doesn't put Venice. on the World Heritage list. They don't even discuss it this year. I think we should just remember too that we have really different uh, policies and legal framework when it comes to groundwater versus surface water. And we see surface water, you know, as bad as it's in some places, it, 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 at least it does in places that's keeping up with the science a little bit, whereas groundwater is something really medieval. Um, in Texas, where I come from, they still have, they call it the wall of the biggest pump. So whatever water is underneath your property, you own, you have a right to. There's no acknowledgement that it might be connected to a, a stream that has an endemic species or something like that. That doesn't matter. It's been tested in court a number of times, and the law has always been upheld. Uh, even in the Ogallala Aquifer, you know, this massive agricultural system in the north, I mean, fed by Pleistocene waters and so forth, being completely uh, depleted, but still, whoever can withdraw the most water Right. That's a really interesting case because that, I guess, that's a hunch, is the same that applied to oil. Because oil drilling was the same, who was the first to get the pump in, could draw the oil away from underneath the, the neighbor's property. Which, as I understand it, again, I'm not a legal expert, but I just want to throw out some ideas because people should be following up or could be following up on this. That legal systems made for drilling. Uh, oil in the, United, in the Netherlands are now used to prevent heat pumps because the oil company, so it's a whole question of substructure land ownership, and that's why I think again the land use question, land ownership question is important. You don't own the land, you only know own the net land 40 meters under your property, right? So the heat that sits 40 meters under your property can be drilled out. And so there are legal systems who determine who can drill out the heat under your property. So that's why I think this, these whole systems, water thinking has, is embedded in other legal systems, even in terms of uh, energy, green energy. One, two, yes. So just two quick points. One, I mean, I, I do think, I mean, as it's coming out, everything is very specific, right? So I think one of the roles of the heritage is to help people see the context in which these things happen. Mm -hmm. So the water pumping, we have that conversation about the expansion of the West and homesteading, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why Kind of the United States landed where it landed, by right? I mean, so history matters to these questions. Um, but coming back to the, the I'll give you an example that's very present in my mind about the potential role for water heritage. So let me take Florence, right? So Florence is the Arno, as you know, runs through the city, and it does flood. And if you look at the hydrograph of this river, it's actually quite extraordinary. In a span of 12 hours, you can get a seven meter difference in. Um, in, uh, in height of the river, but of course, you know, the 1964 flood is this famous flood of the whole city. Now, if you ask yourself, why is that? Well, it turns out that in the watershed, there's, it's forested, like in, uh, in, uh, in Spain, and it's all coppiced. Do you know what coppicing is? Coppicing is a practice of felling trees, cutting trees to produce uh, charcoal, because oh. the south of Europe didn't have any coal. And so when industrialization happened, all of the Balkans, you know, the south of France, south of Germany, all of Italy, turned to coppice forests. So instead of having tall growth forests, you end up with coppice forests. So somebody comes, um, cuts your forest every three, four years, and puts some, and today you can only use it for five of a year. But it used to power industrialization in the south of Europe. It turns out coppicing is very bad for soil because it leads to very strong compaction because the roots are not very deep. And, uh, and so it turns out that the coppicing that started in the 1750s with industrialization has compacted so, so much that makes runoff into the river way, way faster. Okay, so then we have to change the land use. So if we went back to tall forests, which right away has a economic value because then you can sell wood to Ikea and do all sorts of things. Um, now, why doesn't it convert back? Well, 
for two reasons. One is the ownership structure, right? So all these landscapes are owned by a monastery or some whatever, right? And they all have little parcels of land. And Italy has a law that in order to change the use of land from coppice to something else, because they wanted to transition, uh, they asked for legal change. And you can't go back once you've done it. And that change requires a notary public, which costs money. And all of these individual owners are subscale, so they can't afford it. And so they don't change. And so suddenly a conversation about hydrology and the Arnon, you know, and about the Ophisti and how the Ophisti are threatened. What a, what a heritage story really in Florence is not about the Arnon and the Ophisti, it's about the monasteries owning the landscape. Right? So how do you systematically reveal where the problem actually lies? And it's a historical issue, it's not a technological issue, but it prevents us, it's 26 million hectares of coppiced forest in Europe. If you were to convert it to tall forest, it's a gigaton of carbon that you take out of the atmosphere. So it matters, but it's a historical heritage issue. Yes, that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to think about. Get out, and I, I, I was just thinking about the time machine. I mean, the, so this is European time machine project, where the idea is to, how can we use big data of the past to change the lens of the designing of the future. I mean, that's exactly when you can agglomerate these kinds of small, um, small, seemingly small problems, themes, and their impact, and then you can say, well, this is happening in Florence, this is happening here in Denmark. You know, see the system, you see a system that is much more. Much broader. And yes. But yeah. sorry, one and then you. <laughs> okay. uh, quick uh, response to, uh, to the modern resource uh, development. And development in Nazo is different, and it will affect the society and the culture and the, uh, the others. Uh, for example, the, uh, how to uh, integrate the surface water and the uh, uh, groundwater? It is the single resources. So it's uh, between the production and uh, of the surface water and the groundwater as well. So how to develop, develop uh, mean, you can define the development mining. Yeah. Development is, uh, means the, uh, the, the water resources come from the uh, rainfall with the precipitation and uh, for something lost, it's a snow and melting again and for the water resources it's uh, uh, So. <clears throat> Uh, if you develop uh, the uh, water is uh, uh, using a different way, it could be effective environmental uh, sector. For example, <coughs> you build a dam, and uh, probably you can affect the ecological system. Yeah? And uh, if you put the water into the ground, and then it less uh, uh, effect, uh, impact to the environmental sector. So how to uh, define a uh, development? Uh, from my experience, a uh, local experience, a uh, local knowledge, uh, and a local uh, solution. So it uh, could be done in, in, uh, everywhere because it's a very large uh, question uh, to the different culture in a different area and different uh, policy. So the, uh, from my experience, the local
Beispiel auf, äh, auf äh, Line Numbers. Uh, but it's also competing heritage values. I mean, there was cultural landscapes and their values, but it, the dropping of the water table affects uh, archaeological heritage, you know, uh, which is unique in that sense, because it would have dropped the water preservation, which is being under threat. So here yeah, we have competing land use issues, competing heritage values as well. So I think that's a, a case that, is, that we could be solved as well. So the, well, the surface water, water management system in the pools, uh, as well as underground. Yes, and since we're in the Netherlands, I, I don't know how much this is spread as an example. I always love the, um, va the, the, the Vassena uh, area along the beach, which is the richest area in the Netherlands, but which is also the area where the wastewater of Amsterdam gets, gets cleaned up in the underground. So but the, the other thing I was going to propose is kind of a scalar look at water, which we were already hearing. There's groundwater, there's uh, the, all these layers that need to be um, examined in their own way, um, so we have to put stable up water, um, which is, I think, interesting. There's one big question that still... Oh, I just have a couple of comments. I'm Jeff McDonald from the University of Montana in the United States, and I just wanted to build up some of my American colleagues' comments too, especially with dams, uh, and certainly speaking to a lot of points of country and share colleagues' case studies if I could. Um, in the Western United States, we're observing there are massive changes occurring in land use. Um, a lot of these drivers can be a natural occurrence of forest fires we've been dealing with. There's a lot of drawing off of our waterways to fight these fires. Um, a couple of things that come to mind from the legal realm, I would like to uh, offer the work of Michelle Bryan, who's a professor of the at the University of Montana. She is a legal professor and has done a lot of work um, confronting these issues with the legal realm, land use, and water use specifically, and also bringing in heritage. So these uh, cases you very well published in law journals so easy to find. Also, the Blackfoot Clearwater Stewardship Act is a very pivotal case we're playing out right now. It's curated by Montana Senator Ron Chester, who was recently compelled into our national spotlight. But he uh, got on the card for this localized version, which is still taking out this national model. The other thing that I deal with pretty frequently, and we bring up the topic of multiple cultural narratives, and where um, some of the points brought up about indigenous communities, that is an area where I work with fairly regularly. And, and coming from UN's Department of Cultural Heritage and Applied Anthropology, there is a direct effort right now in the West to bring the indigenous peoples more into the conversation. And a, a very recent case study, which is exploring all those, is um, Milltown Dam. Montana has a lot of super fun sites, which are byproducts of century of mining waste and tailings. And so these dams, unfortunately, can now back up a whole lot of pollution. And you're cutting your head as you know. You know so those become other mitigating factors, but some of those success stories, like the Milltown Dam Project is playing out. And the last one I'll share, which is emerging case studies, the Rattlesnake Creek Dam, which I have been consulting with in the past year, which involves the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes, also working with the state of Montana, Department of Natural Resources, and the city of Missoula on a decommissioned Lowhead Dam. And in a rather than odd reversal, rather than preserving as you're saying, some of this crumbling infrastructure and one of the earliest water conveyance systems to the city of Missoula, drawing off of these natural forms, building these retention ponds, but still having water conduits entirely redly is pretty fascinating. But like this now kind of dual return to landscape that's occurring now in cooperation with the tribes is restoring this riparian landscape, restoring some of their fish ladders, and returning this back to earlier pattern of subsistence for these native tribes. So these are some emerging case studies I did want to share because they're fascinating and they hopefully will start to set some new legal precedents for how we might go forward. I'm sorry to actually to the European conference. I don't know it's my fault. Okay, enjoy the rest of the round table. Sorry. And we also see that people start coming in from the other round table. Uh, we will hold them off for a second. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Um, what I would like to suggest, because I think there's a lot of knowledge around the table, a lot of interest. As I said, in the book that we have, we sort of tried to group them based on the knowledge that was in the room at the time, and then we brought a few more people. But what I'm hearing today, and I just want to test this very quickly with you, and then see who would be interested in kind of following up and writing this um, in your create another book or a project and hold another conference or something. Because I find it's much more important that you talk to each other already than doing things together. Um, I think that if I were to do another book or if we, anybody's interested, I think we should have taken from a thematic approach. I haven't gotten organized quite yet, but it's, uh, I think we have art and literature approaches, for example. We should look at it from the lens of politics, from the lens of, of legal studies, economics, which is sort of the big elephant in the room that we didn't even get to mention. We didn't mention migration either, because I would really like to see Sandra, 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 can you give us a minute to finish off? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I think things like migration we didn't even get to touch upon because we had even started about it, how water has driven migration over time. And your point of contextualizing, seeing what kind of uh, migration has water set up in the past. And this very problem is always difficult, but to see how far it actually goes embedded in society change. Gender we haven't touched upon. We haven't touched um, what well, institutions we sort of talked about, we talked about layers, legal systems. So I think in the end what I heard is our idea of looking at uh, space, culture, and society is something that was very present to me. So even if we were to pick that up, and whoever is interested, I would say just send me an email because otherwise we get shut down the But that said, if you are interested in it, let's collect ideas. Send me your case studies, write them up because I wasn't big enough to write all of this down. And let's think how we can structure it, make it great, and email it to us, and let's see where we can go with this. Thank you very much. And, uh,